So ladies and gentlemen, good evening. The last time I spoke here, I said that India is India because Indians know there are many beginnings. Because Indians are capable of living all at once in many times. Today, I shall move into another pitch and think of how Indians are able to live in many spaces. To begin with, at least in the Sanskrit language, we have a very fascinating opening for getting into this idea of many spaces. And that opening comes from the notion of non-space, zero, nothing, absence. Well, the Latin words for zero would be a matter of study. But for the Sanskrit language, uh, which has uh, an intimate relation with many languages in the country, though not with all languages in the country. At least in the case of the Sanskrit language, which works in many cases, in the case of many languages, like the topping in a pizza, with the base being Prakrut and the topping being Sanskrit. But nonetheless, the Sanskrit is pervasive uh, in that language. The word for absence, non-space, zero, would be shunya. And shunya is vacuous, empty. There's nothing there to see in it. It is there, and you can see it because there is nothing there in it. But there is another word in the Sanskrit language for shunya, and that is purna. Probably those of you who are familiar with the Hindi script, Devanagari script, know that when a sentence ends, we use purna viram. That is indicator of an empty space. Break in a nothing. This Purna is also an indicator of a space. But this space is filled with things. And it is filled in such a wonderful way that if you take things out of that, it still remains filled. And if you add things into it, it is still never insufficient to accommodate those things. There is a very famous Upanishadic uh, line about this, uh, how you can uh, divide uh, this Purna with any damn thing in the world and it yet remains Purna. Uh, uh, whatever you do to Purna, Purna will remain Purna. Because Purna is here. Now that's a, a very complex philosophical challenge for us because here is a clear foundation for space but Purna is an emptiness and therefore there can never be a here without anything being there. But I'll not get into that level of uh, intellection. I'll just accept on the face of it, Purnam, Idam, Purnam, Adam, etc., etc. You probably have heard of this. So there is Shunya, which is vacuous. There is Purna, which is filled with things in such a manner that those things become, by the act of being inside Purna, immortal, eternal, never dying, never diminishing. There is, ladies and gentlemen, a third version of this, and that is kh. Kh. 
There's an absolutely fascinating essay by Anand Kumar Swami on the philosophy of K. What is K? Now, uh, in the in Marathi language, K has given rise to many words. For instance, Khagola Shastra. Kh is sky, the skies. Uh, a word for birds is khag, that which is gochar, that which is mobile, inside kh. And what is this kh? Kh is an emptiness, a nonness, a non-space surrounding all of us. But in such a manner that as against Purna, which is things in it which never die, inside Kha, there is nothing which is permanent. Everything dies there. And yet, it is emptiness which is specially, indi specially indicated, marked by the word Kha. Now, why am I getting into this nitty-gritty of the Sanskrit language and so many notions of Nonness zero, just to place before you for your consideration the fact that the mind of people in this subcontinent, the minds of people in this subcontinent, have felt perfectly at ease with the idea of many spaces being there all at the same time. They did not eliminate Kha because Purna was there. They did not remove Purna out of their script or language or conversation because Shunya was there. Cultural memory gets assailed in times of contraction of people's will to be themselves. When the being of a people comes under an attack, a cultural attack or a natural attack, people try quite often away from their vision of time and space. I said in my last lecture that language is the bridge between one's consciousness and the world out there, phenomenal world. And I'd also said that this bridge works within the framework of time and space. We construct through our idea of time and through our idea of space what is out there. India is constructed by Indians in terms of their understanding of times and their understanding of spaces. When this understanding changes, when a, cultural, when a cultural amnesia overpowers us, possesses us, in a way transforms us, displaces us, the effects are felt socially as well as politically. I'll take some examples to explain how this idea of many spaces got contracted socially and is getting contracted politically. So here I go first to a couple of social examples. First about society and then about polity because it is society that is the foundation of polity, not an ideology but society itself, what it is and what it is not as well. We are in the month of February 2022. This month brings to my mind the memory of something that happened exactly 150 years ago. That is in the year 1872. In that year, a murder took place. Let me tell you the story of this murder. I don't subscribe to the idea of murdering anybody, but I am only bringing the memory of that event 
that re remains in my mind for sharing it with you. In 1871, a year before 72, before February 72, the new Governor General in Calcutta, Lord Mayo, decided to bring in a legislation. That legislation was called the Criminal Tribes Act of India. This legislation has a little bit of story behind it. So let me, in order to complete my story, let me get into that story as well. Towards the first, uh, towards the end of the 18th century, almost all princes were defeated by the East India Company soldiers or they had lost nerve. But definitely by 1818, with the fall of the Peshwas, the East India Company had a fairly good hold over all of the previously existing states. The nature of the treaties changed, um, varied, uh, but the control nonetheless was there. And at that time, the disbanded soldiers of those princes became an issue for the East India Company. The soldiers were on the payrolls of the princes previously, but not being able to maintain the armies or not being able to support the armies, fund the armies, the soldiers had to be let loose and they were moving about. The British wanted to disarm these soldiers because they were a potential threat to the control of the East India Company over the princely states. They appointed a, a, an officer, uh, Sleeman, for detecting the flow of the arms or clashes or violent uh, instances and Sleeman worked mainly in central India, but not just in the center of central India, also he worked also to the west and the east of central India and covering a little more than what was the central Indian province. He listed these instances of armed clashes for over 25 years, but he listed all these instances by mention of the community of the persons. And that list of communities was used after 1857, which was a jolt to the company rule, and the company in fact lost the control and the sovereign had to come in. British king or queen was to be the emperor or empress of India after 1857. The list, the Sleeman list, the Sleeman list of communities, the Sleeman list of communities that were suspected to be criminal by habit was brought to use and put in the form of an enactment in 1871 producing the infamous Criminal Tribes Act of India. This act had an appendix giving the names of communities. And these names, I mean, if you look at those names now, uh, you will be surprised beyond limit. The very first name was Meena. Now, who were the Meenas? I mean, we know Meenas belong to Rajasthan. Many IAS and IPS officers name, by the name Meena you might have met. Who were the Meenas? The Meenas were the coin makers of India. And why did the Meenas make coins in India? Because the coins used in Banaras and the coins used in Tanjore had a parity. 
it was not as if the king of tanjore king of mysore or king of kolhapur produced their own coins at an arbitrary value it is that hundi written somewhere in travancore could actually be encashed somewhere close to calcutta because there was an economic framework which was over and above the powers of these princes within which the states worked voluntarily and if not voluntarily because of the course of history of indian economy the minas knew the proportion between the weight of a coin and the value of a coin they knew the necessary metallurgy to make those coins very often as a child i seen in hindi movies a mina bazaar and a mina bazaar is a place where metallurgical skills appear in the craft minas were listed as a criminal community they were not arm wielders they were not uh, arms smugglers but they came in the way of the british desire to create their own mint the british wanted to mint their own coins with the stamp of uh, either the uh, uh, empress or the emperor on it the king or the queen of britain appeared on the coin and those who made coins those who made those other coins became counterfeiters and the counterfeiters were at the top of the list of the criminal tribes of india second in that list even more tragic throughout the 13th century the 14th 15th 16th 17th and 18th century security was provided for women by a policing system particularly women of the political class the rani vamsha the queens if you like to call them queens that word has now many other meanings rani vamsha was given security by a specially trained group of soldiers called hijras and they had their own skills in use of arms which were necessary for their purpose the second in the list after minas is hijras they became a criminal tribe when today's transgender activists uh, might feel you know get boiling with rage at this terrible a uh, criminalization demonization of an, an entire community not individuals an entire community the list goes on and on i mentioned the other day uh, in informal uh, conversation that the wadars who are excellent stone masons and who understand the geological structure geo, uh, of uh, rocks uh, uh, beyond description because they got centuries of training from the times of king ashoka who did the rock edicts who built those rock edicts the wadars of this country the wadars because they use a heavy hammer were listed in the criminal tribes these three are examples that we can easily understand but there are others in that list and in order to understand their inclusion i had to move the story further back in history because all these stories are interconnected so let me let me take a step back in history and then add that story to the main story that i am trying to present before you in europe during the 100 years war the french and the british the british and the french sovereign always felt very shaky because the task of maintaining soldiers was done by the barons and the lords the king or the queens did not have their own soldiers as such in order to maintain a paid army and you know that 
we often give this great credit to Napoleon Bonaparte for creating trained army. But trained army was a step possible because there was a paid army. In order to create a paid army so that there is the requisite number of soldiers available in times of any war emergency on either side of the channel. The British first and then the French decided to change their taxation structure and this happened through throughout the 17th century and up to the beginning of the 18th century. What was the change in the taxation structure? The change was earlier tax collected was levied on the measure of yield. What things you got in the farm were required to be taxed in that measure. The change was slight, but it was a very fundamental change. The change was instead of levying tax on the yield, the king started levying tax on the area of the farm because yield varies from year to year. In a good year, this excellent crop, in another year, there is no crop tax variation, revenue variation. But land remains fixed in area. A hundred, a hundred acres land will remain 100 acres even 5 or 10 or 20 or 100 years later. That gave those kings or queens certainty of revenues allowing them to engage armies in a fixed number and then fight their wars. Well, they were perfectly free to do so. But in this act, was embedded a principle and the principle was that a taxpayer is related to land. A citizen must have some relation with land. If you are not landed or if you are not engaged in labor which is land related, if you do not have a land related address, if you do not have a land identity, then you became a non-citizen. This kind of mind was brought to India in the 19th century, middle of the 19th century, and the entire attitude to who is, who is citizen, who is the Praja of the British Empire, and who is not Praja, non-Praja, uh, that discrimination uh, got into action. So, everybody who was nomadic in India became a suspect in the eyes of the power that was there. And anybody who had land, land definition, land relation was accepted as the Praja of whom the British government was the Mai Baf government. They were the children of the king or the queen. But the non-sedentary nomads and were, not, were not seen as either the obligation of the state or the asset of the state. And who were the nomads? The Baul singers in Bengal. They got into the list of criminal tribes. And you know, Baul singers sing only of love for God. Tagore would be among the greatest Baul singers in that tradition in a way. Criminal tribes. The entertainers, the kaikadis, the, you know, those who walk on ropes, they became a criminal tribe. Not just that, but people who manage animal stock, donkeys, camels, cows, elephants, all of them became criminal tribes. The Bharwads in Gujarat, criminal tribe. The Gadi Wadar, that is one who carries uh, mitti, 
from one place, criminal tribe. The uh, the uh, Vanagujars in the Himalayas, criminal tribe. The Sadhus, the medicants, criminal tribes. The Bairagis, uh, the difference between Sadhus and Bairagis, Sadhus are uh, only given to God. The Bairagis also given to God and medicine at the same time. They distribute medicine as criminal tribes. Wandering singers, entertainers, people who had uh, who had caused diffusion of uh, you know spread of information and culture in this country all through, you know those who sold saffron or silk, they used to move all the way from Tibet or China to Kerala. But people like that came under the scanner. 1871 Criminal Tribes Act set the tone. The nomads of this country came to be seen as criminal tribes of India. That British story got mixed into the colonial story. And in 1871, a new attitude of looking at people emerge. It was refined. 1893 or 92, perhaps 93, another version of the criminal tribes, all of it was brought even to cover the Nizam state. And the Nizam state had so many varieties of lovers of God. Allah's people, so many of them, Madaris, Domaris, all those who moved between what was the erstwhile Nizam state and what was the ununited, uh, not yet formed Karnatak state across what are today's borders, they all came to be described as criminal tribes, the Yenadis, the Yerakulas. Between Rajasthan and Gujarat, those who moved from one to another culture, criminal tribes. Not one or two or a dozen or two dozen communities, 191 communities were brought under the this oppressive act, 1871, 1893, then once again 1913, 1924, several versions of the act making it increasingly criminalizing, tormenting, oppressive. So many versions were delivered by the colonial rule. And a great genius of police who used to work in Nizam state decided on his grasp of what the what Europeans call anthropology at that time, decided on the basis of anthropology that in India, if a Brahmin son necessarily becomes a priest, and a merchant's son necessarily becomes a vaniya, baniya, then a criminal's son or daughter will necessarily be criminal. Therefore, I mean, not just this derivation, not just this conclusion, action followed. This police officer, Stephen, wrote in a report that therefore this should, these people should not be allowed to procreate. Now, how to stop them? from creating children, a method was invented, a peculiarly colonial method. The method was not to allow them to sleep during night. So they were, they were forced to report to the nearest police station four times during night. And if you are required to go to the nearest police station and report there that, yes, I am present, obviously you won't have time to sleep with somebody to produce a child. In some cases, three times, in some cases, twice. The theory that somebody is born a criminal was not enough. They added yet another theory. And that theory came from uh, child psychology as British understood it during the 1840s applied to India 40 years later. The child psychology theory was a product of 
a very upsetting social turmoil in Britain itself. That was called the the Chartist movement. What was the Chartist movement? People who were fed up with the industrial uh, production system where labor was not uh, paid, not, not given enough wages for all the hours of work. People fed up with having to work for 15 hours, but being paid only for six hours of work. They were protesting. And on the forefront of that protest were children. Because in those times, uh, where energy was produced still with the help of coal, primarily coal, the soot in the chimneys required to be cleaned very regularly. And the chimneys were narrow. I mean, all of you who have been to Britain and seen those row houses with chimneys you know, jutting out, know how difficult it would be to get into chimneys. Uh, and let's not, uh, let's not uh, laugh at the British. We are doing far worse to the people in India who, who clean our gutters today. We are not no more civilized, neither worse nor better, identical. Children had to get into chimneys. There are so many British poets who wrote about the chimney sweepers. They said, I mean, in India, uh, the upper class students studied Charles Lamb's essays on chimney sweepers as if this was great literature, work of beauty. But it was actually talking about these children dying inside the chimneys or falling dead. There's a, there's a William Blake poem, I mean, uh, uh, on Holy Thursday. Uh, how uh, And that poem says, how can God be happy looking at such a long queue standing outside the you know cathedral for you know waiting for food to be served is this piety is this compassion but i'll not get into that poem just now <clears throat> these children working for 14 hours in the factories cleaning chimneys hungry children they were marching, they were wandering around in the streets of London. Any, any of you who has read any of Charles Deacon's novels will notice those children. They decided to come together and wrote a charter of demand signed by hundreds, thousands, in such a way that the, 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 the sheaves of paper collected formed a car load and that car was driven to the uh, you know to buckingham palace charters demand because this was a charter of demands and what did the charter say single line that line was equal days wages for equal days labor take 14 hours work from me pay me 14 hours wages The royalty appointed a commission to deal with this. And the commission came up with two extraordinary recommendations. Recommendation number one was, these children are not capable of learning Greek and Latin, but teach them English. So the first time English as a subject was introduced in British schools was after the Chartist movement as punishment to the children. Thank goodness we have taken in this country that punishment for so many decades without realizing what is happening to us. It began as punishment. The second recommendation that came from the commission was, if the children do not get into behaving, even after teaching them English, put them in reformatory settlements. You know, all, the, all those villains that Deacons depicts tormenting those children are the, uh, you know, sentries or the, are the wardens of those reformatory settlements. That idea of reformatory settlement was active in the British mind in 1840s. That was brought to India to deal with these nomadic communities and the British rule in India created settlements here. 
reformatory settlements. The specifications were different because here they thought they were dealing not just with criminal children, but criminal adults who are capable of producing criminal children. The specification was that the fencing would be 14 feet tall, made of wire, in such a way that not even a billy, not even a cat can jump across. And if you want to see the kind of fencing that was specified for these reformatories, these settlements, you must watch an Australian movie called The Rabbit Foot Fence, Rabbit Foot Fencing. If one of you seen, I don't know, but do see it. There was a wire net laid in Australia by the same you know, colonial era, British power, which ran for about 800 kilometers, not allowing people on this side to move to the other side. I mean, that movie is about an eight-year-old girl taking two of her younger siblings along those 800 kilometers because that girl and her brother or sister, they brought to this reformatory settlement in Australia. Similar things happen in India. Criminal settlements, criminal community settlements were created in 52 locations. The one in Tanjore, another in Hubli, uh, one in Gadag, uh, yet another in uh, Fulton in Maharashtra, uh, then in Ahmedabad, uh, in Indore, many places. These people were made to do work which was non-paid work. If some of you have visited the Gokak Dam, which is in Karnataka, or Bhadgar Dam in Maharashtra near Pune, you will notice that these are dams built during the decades when the labor which required no payment at all was available. And these dams, I mean, this labor was used uh, the, from the closest, for instance, the Hubli settlement labor was used for construction of Gokak Dam. The Fulton uh, settlement labor was used for constructing the Bhor Dam the, uh, Nira, on the Nira River. Streets, railway lines, laying the railway tracks, constructing streets, constructing government buildings, all of that work was done by these people, 190 communities. The plight remained completely unknown to the rest of India, except for a very few leaders from the Congress of that time who were sensitive to you know, what was happening. Now, I said something happened 150 years before our present year. And what happened was this first Criminal Tribes Act was passed by Lord Mayo in Calcutta in October 71. Three months and three weeks later, Mayo was visiting Andaman. And at Port Blair, a person belonging to one such community from Northwest who was deported from there to Andaman, his name was Sher Ali Afradi. Afradi killed Mayo. He used a knife to murder Mayo. I don't know if if you had chance of looking at his. There were two statues of Mayo made. Uh, one was sent to Cumberland, which was his native place, and the other was kept in India. It was at Jaipur until very recent times, but then some controversy erupted, and now that uh, statues moved to the Mayo School. The criminal tribes remained in this state till 1952, when India became independent, they did not become independent because they were still seen as criminal tribes. A gentleman called Ayangar worked to write a report in 1950, Ayangar Committee Report, and Jawaharlal Nehru went all the way to Sholapur to cut open the barbed wire which made the fencing for the settlement in Sholapur, which was the largest, in August 1952, and freed them. 
by then the schedule of cast was already ready schedule of tribes was already finished and therefore these people could get into neither the sts nor the scs and remained hanging in between for several decades there was nobody to look after them till mahashweta devi the bengali writer raised their voice with mahashweta devi i had the great good fortune of working on this issue and then we somehow managed to create a national commission for them and that's a different story i written about it in a book called a nomad called thief the population of these communities today as estimated because it has never been counted since 1952 the elections first elections were already held the population of these people was never counted in any of the censuses but 1931 had some census and in that census what your figures are given if we go by increase in population and so on today the population of these communities in india would be closely 14 crores not a small population but these communities are wiped out of our social space completely a child belonging to any of these communities goes to a school and even a small bit of a chalk is lost in the classroom the teacher will first say oh aapne churaya hoga if women of this community get into a lane or a locality or and now uh, we have got into this terrible habit of making all our habitat gated we got gates and sentries there a woman comes in to sell something women inside the families and houses say oh this lady my this woman might steal away run away with your child you might have heard of these stories suspicion haunts them the nation looks at them with suspicion they are seen even today as the kanjars the sansis of punjab the banjaras even today they are seen as people who can entertain you from a distance but not the people who can come any close to you because close to you they could be a potential danger they could be a potential danger to you in your mind because the idea of citizenship was designed way back in england in those centuries that teaches you to suspect nomads and value only the sedentary people a space in our society is wiped out because this society had the provision of belonging to land as well as freeing oneself from land and wandering about walking around wandering about going on yatras uh, releasing yourself from the burdens of the material life was part of a vision of life i will now come to a second example of how we have been wiping out space spaces many layers of spaces i said socially and politically in society and in polity the second example is of course of the adivasi all of us know that this in this country in the subcontinent one is either a member of a jati member of a caste or a tribe one cannot be a tribe and yet be jati one cannot be caste yet be tribe now are these tribes ethnically any different ethnically any different from the people belonging to jatis the answer is in absolute clear terms no genetics tells us that the entire south asian population is of the same source same stock if all of us 130 crores in this country go for a genetic test all of us will realize that we all are brothers and sisters i mean we all we all come from the same mothers who walked out of africa long time back i mentioned that time in my first lecture 65000 years ago 
and the, and this is not a claim that i am making uh, a, a, a great scientist like david rick in a book which was published in 2018 i believe uh, who we are and how we came here based on more than 10000 samples from cc uh, you know uh, mb of Hi hyderabad the cellular and mic mi mi microcellular biology all of us are together yet there are tribes and there are castes so how come the tribes are different from the castes there's a question that we need to ask and we we need to answer that question the question is why is it that i am not a tribe or my wife is not a caste why what is this identity from where does it come this identity comes from the times of the indus civilization in harappa because of the affluence that an urban civilization requires as its foundation classification of work categorization of work labor practice had already happened and that civilization had a fairly long time to allow this to happen and those who made metals those who made rocks those who made wood those who made cloth those who made something else different requirements of labor were fulfilled by the same stock of people but acquiring different labor identities different jatis however please allow me to pause here to reflect on one thing the jatis of the harappan civilization did not have an hierarchy arrangement that hierarchy was brought in much later almost 500 years after the harappan civilization declined entirely and got wiped out that sense of hierarchy came in with another language another civilization entering the stream of the the stock of people that existed here those who did not accept that new idea of hierarchy remained performing those tasks but did not get into the hierarchy of tasks and therefore not into the caste system they remained outside the caste system became our tribes in this country though genetically we all come from the same stock why i i must add here yet another uh, layer of this tribe identity when i am talking uh, i mentioned the uh, the the genetic uh, past of many of the tribes but it is true that tribes exist in the world only outside europe you will be surprised to know this europeans have some nomadic communities some gypsies but they all gone from asia to or is east uh, eastern europe to uh, western europe colonialism created tribes in australia new zealand canada united states the indigenous people the aborigines the maoris the indians by which the colonial powers meant people existing before us that category could not be applied to african states where colonialism went but with the african states it a, a completely different but a terrible terrible thing happened socially and the terrible thing is the entire map of africa was drawn not looking at the landfall or the hills or the rivers of africa but in a drawing room in geneva in straight lines not consistent with the populations of africa but consistent with mathematical formulas that europeans followed about the square kilometers square miles areas because the map of africa was a result of conclusion of a long war franco prussian war 
1871 africa got mapped and that mapping resulted in partition of a large community into a large part and a small part in the small part in another larger community those who were the spillover were named as tribes in africa they are not like the indigenous people of the you know america canada or australia new zealand therefore today in africa if one talks of the indigenous people and tribes and natives uh, there is a, a tremendously strong political um, the, uh, annoyance political annoyance in the minds of africans in india the tribes here were not like people in the us or the indigenous they were the people who did not accept the idea of hierarchy and therefore had disallowed the formation of feudal state among them tribes were people without rajas tribes were people who govern themselves in a community way let me go back to that year 1817 when all the princes were defeated etc <clears throat> the land belonging to the princes the resources belonging to the princes in a way indirectly or directly were the were under the control of the british first east india company and subsequently the uh, the emperor the the queen or the king the but there were areas where there was no prince to sign a treaty with and that area remained outside the control of the prince uh, the, the king or the queen in 1870s that entire area was brought under a law but not passed in the governor general's council in calcutta passed in london and that law declared all such areas in india as the sovereign domain sovereign the king or the queen domain territory control over territory and do you know what the british did with this sovereign domain because they had to fight a constant war with the rising german power in europe after bismarck came to power the british wanted to have a massive navy the germans had developed a new technique of creating navy because germans had relatively poor access to the sea they decided that the north sea would be frozen and they decided uh, and ships could be launched only in one part of the year the germans decided to create uh, a large number of vessels to be launched in the seas all at one time in a short period in order to create those large number of vessels the germans decided to grow forest in such a way that those trees become usable for making vessels all at a predicted time if you go to germany and look at the forest there you will notice that all trees are of similar height what is your concept of forest i mean vana upavana completely different this industrial forest which began with the uh, the idea began in napoleon's uh, imagination uh, came to a fruition in the germany the british countered the german idea by creating their forest department in india not in england the british created a forest department but there was no forest land in england that land came from the tribal land the non hierarchic people's land in india which was uh, acquired by the british by this single act sovereign domain the adivasis of india have fought many battles against this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, confiscation of land rights throughout the colonial times 
when it, the story goes all the way back to 1850s, where uh, we had uh, people like Siddhu and Kanu, and then the Santal rebellion, and continues uh, all the way through the 20th century, where there's a Birsa Munda. And of course, they did not get an Ambedkar, because the Adivasis had refused to unite themselves in terms of a single theology. They did not become Hindu or Muslim or Christians. They were self-reliant. They knew the value of labor. They understood what is community domination, community ownership, community possession. And uh, their gods, in any case, were not located outside the space seen by the human eye. They, those gods were located inside, in their homes or around their homes. Even today, when somebody dies in Adivasi's community, they do not think that that person goes to heaven or hell outside the you know, known universe. They, they truly believe, seriously believe, that that person remains here, but the person goes outside the time that we experience, not space but time. It's a very fascinating uh, difference, Philo very fascinating philosophical take on the question of disappearance, uh, non-existence. Adivasi communities in this country were treated as step children of the British power, as a praja, but less than praja. Because they were only there to provide resources such as timber, forest resources, that's all. And that attitude continued even post-independence. And if anyone from the Adivasi community raises voice, that voice is understood as violent rejection of the state. And indeed it is a rejection of the state. Because the idea of the state imposed on Adivasis is not their idea of the state. You might ask me why I am saying this. I am saying this because in the constituent assembly debates, Jaipal Singh had asked this question. Jaipal Singh Munda, you must have heard this name. Uh, let me mention him with great pride, great sense of pride. Jaipal Singh Munda is a... You know, in a, in a colonized country, if a team ever went to the Olympics, that itself was a miracle. And if a team won a gold, that was more than a miracle. The first gold that India won was by a team laid by Jaipal Singh Munda. Adivasi, hockey, great hockey player. And he had even got into the ICS. He was educated at Cambridge. I mean, he may be Adivasi, but Cambridge educated, ICS man. He left ICS service and decided to go to Africa to look at the Adivasis in Africa, tribals in Africa to understand their situation. He was a great hockey player and he led the hockey team of India at least for five Olympics. He, in the constant assembly, asked the entire assembly one question when the question of assimilation of states in the Indian Union came, he said, we too will join the Union, but will it be on, will it be on equal footing? The answer given by the Constituent Assembly to Jaipal Munda was yes. When Adivasis come in, they will come in this India on equal footing. And it is the credit goes to Jaipal Singh that the northeastern states got their legitimate community councils. That the constitution had a schedule 5 and schedule 6, se several rights uh, going to Adivasis, Jaipal Singh. Yet, after independence, the equal footing commitment was lost sight of soon after Varier Elvin died and Jawaharlal Nehru died. Varier Elvin is another great name 
when we come to tribes uh, ram uh, ram goa of bangalore has written a wonderful biography of elvin elvin prepared five principles nehru act to treat adivasis on equal footing elvin was uh, uh, educated in england with a doctor he came to pune Uh, he was with uh, uh, Sarons of India Society. Then he went to Gandhi. Got influenced by Gandhi. Gandhi did not mind very Elvin smoking his cigarettes. Uh, he understood sense of you know sense of freedom. So Elvin uh, stayed in Sabarmati Ashram in one room, the front room th- that Gandhi used for meeting his visitors. And when Gandhi was put in jail, uh, that n- late night the police came looking for Gandhi. Gandhi wrote on a piece of paper. a uh, very you take the help of thakur bappa go to adivasis elvin took his command with thakur bappa's help he went to chatisgarh and then to uh, madhya pradesh uh, what was madhya pradesh what is now chatisgarh rajnandgarh and uh, he described the indian tribals for indians for the first time it was through elvin's book that india modern india post colonial india india after since colonialism understood adivasis for the first time elvin's five principles were do not disturb them treat them on their own terms do not think that you know their law is any inferior to our law panchashil nehru wrote this he wrote uh, after nehru had sent him to the northeast frontier area nefa which today we know as northeast Uh, he described that you know the, uh, in the book what could be done for nefa what could be done for arunachal, arunachal pradesh in particular where he was staying at that time nehru wrote forward to that book and said this is how india should treat the adivasis nehru died and elvin died both in the 60s and soon after that date successive governments have looked at adivasis as naxalites successive governments have used adivasis for gaining power in terms of vote banks but adivasis have never been vote banks because they are extremely individualistic in their orientation and in the last 20 years i have seen i have worked with adivasis for good 3 decades i lived with them for years and years i spoken their languages last 20 years adivasis in this country are officially being described as hindus the name of adivasi community i mentioned gujarat rathwa community in gujarat the birth certificate says rathwa adivasi bracket hindu the hindu is the hierarchic view of space and society adivasi is this non hierarchic view of the world but that view is being imposed on adivasis today the population of adivasis in the country is roughly 11 to 12 crores 8 or 9% between 8 and 9% of population the denotified nomadic tribes were called denotified after nehru withdrew the notification of criminality though a notification of habitual offender was imposed which now has been withdrawn these denotified and nomad nomadic communities or denotified and nomadic tribes which are not the tribes the other communities i spoke about earlier them and the adivasis together form about One fourth or one fifth of Indian population, and that's a small section because they do not constitute the remaining four fifths. I accept. But with these Adivasis and nomadic tribes are the largest numbers of spoken languages in the country. Largest number of cultural diversity features. if i get into talking about the uh, uh, northeastern tribes the santal the mundas the bills the gonds the you know uh, uh, communities in the nilgiris adivasi you know andamans it will take a lot of time 
so i'll not get into it i'll uh, take the benefit of your prior knowledge of that great diversity the great diversity is wiped out in our social existence we have forced these people to become like us and if they do not become like us we treat them as criminals or undesirable part of our society the social spaces are wiped out now i'll turn to from society to polity i could have spoken something similar about the uh, uh, the sufis the parsis and many 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 other examples are there but i taken these two large chunks to talk about how we are hell bent on reducing our idea of space i'll now turn to polity the same constituent assembly which took into consideration the feelings of adivasis decided in its wisdom to make india a union of states as we open the constitution the very first part of the constitution says india which is a union of states now what is this union of states you it's not saying india is a country the constitution does not say india is a nation it's not saying this is desh it's not saying it's a rajya i mean they could have said india that is bharat is a rajya the word rajya was available to them desh they don't use a union of states and what is this peculiar union of states it is a reflection of the existence of india for over several thousand millennia during which indians remained there as belonging together not through polity alone or not through territory alone not through sanskara alone but through a philosophical a finer philosophical understanding of existence indians belong together because they were so different and so diversity is the second nature the foundational principle of being india diverse india was not there because of some universal characteristic but diversal characteristics india was not a university of nationalism india was a diversity of social histories that the constitution accepted and therefore it created a central list a state list and a concurrent list some time back i have taught in universities and i uh, tend to uh, i like to believe that education is my area of work therefore i am keenly interested in education policy some time back this country came up with what is known as the new education policy education famously belongs to the concurrent list and not to the central list but the formation of the education policy was entirely centralized and the education policy document was not referred to the states prior to its becoming a policy through an ordinance through a cabinet decision our federalism has got weakened to that extent i mention education as one field but i can go on mentioning so many things which are at which are and which form an attack on indian federalism it, the idea of india as a union of states is under attack and this idea which is at the heart of the constitution also tells us that if that idea is under attack the constitution itself is under attack and i am not i am i am not 
presenting to you my woes about co the constitution being under attack though that is a terrible thing to happen i am i am presenting to you my agony about the very being of india which is contrary to this kind of lack of understanding of our being a union of states our being a federation i am not think your federation of power centers of states i am thinking of federation at a philosophical level of many ideas of many layers of space and many layers of time india is india only if it can think of itself in terms of many beginnings india is india only if it can think of having many spaces available to itself and for keeping those spaces available india must perpetually remain a federation of states i'll now conclude by just bringing one very important point to you for your consideration i feel very proud that we are an in independent country i i feel jubilant when i think of uh, how we fought for our freedom for our independence so, so that we became a modern free nation reason to feel proud and i i do feel very proud of that however in the history of freedom in the world and history of nation all over the world this is slip this a gap throughout the second half of the 18th century and the 19th century the world was struggling to see the idea of freedom manifest the world was also struggling to see the idea of nation get manifested the french revolution was all about liberty the american war was all about independence freedom the irish struggle was the irish freedom struggle but the italian struggle was italian unification as a nation and so was the german unification as a nation all this happened through the you know uh, almost 100 years from the french revolution to the to, uh, to the irish uh, uh, irish uh, movement for freedom 1870 that's where the irish movement it reached india uh, through home rule league any bazen came and tilak accepted that and then it became part of the congress freedom what what happened to this idea of freedom and idea of nation during the 20th century the idea of nation in its strongest form was seen by the world in the mid 20th century 30s and 40s through italy and germany and ranked against them were the nations that had fought for freedom us england france i do not have to explain this any further i am mightily proud of india's freedom movement because that freedom movement allowed us to articulate in no uncertain words that india is a union of states it is a federation it is a union of states because the idea of india that indians are nurtured through the millennia has taught us to live in many spaces nation region sub region in many deshas many pradeshas many uddeshas the idea of india has allowed us to has taught us to live in many spaces and many times all at once the moment we reduce our spaces or we reduce our understanding of history we become less of indians to that extent it is the death of 
memory and diminishing of this civilization dhanyawad thank you so the enormity and the expanse of uh, the knowledge that you have is uh, beyond words so i have a couple of uh, clarifications if i would like to say it's not a contestation but uh, still i would like to hear from you one is uh, what you said about the uh, absence of hierarchical uh, situation in the harappan uh, civilization etc i been to dholavira only recently two weeks ago and there is very clearly uh, the middle town upper town and the lower town and the upper town obviously had the the feudal lord or whoever it is whatever name you may call and they had a much more luxurious living style of baths and water storage and things like that and and they also had a uh, a place where people would come and congregate and show their uh, you know skills etc etc like a raja and praja kind of thing while it may not fall in line with uh, uh, into the uh, varnashrama type of uh, hierarchy as we have in the jati system uh, but it does have uh, a hierarchical uh, of its own nature this is one uh, area the the second one if you may permit is uh, what you referred to on the day when you talk talked about the uh, when language dies and also today you referred to it of this uh, movement of people migration of people 65000 years ago or 70000 years ago from africa why do we continue to be in this frame when we know historically this is also a very tropical country which could sustain civilization and life very nicely and it was the food was available uh, for picking and uh, uh, to kind of say that you know aryans came from central or central asia or the people came from there and they kind of located themselves here and we became a part of that uh, thing why do we not have uh, a, a a kind of a Uh, theory or whatever it is that you might say that we also had a people here and yes intermingling and mixing of races etc did take place nobody denies that but to deny that uh, from the vedic period which is uh, i don't want to go into the uh, uh, the timing of it and things like that uh, itihasas and puranas say their own uh, uh, time scales uh, which sometimes is very difficult to kind of uh, Uh, can uh, you know agree with anthropologically etc but the fact that uh, uh, we ignore this is something which is very difficult for me to kind of you know live with that we as a people came from central asia and then they kind of got rid of the people who were there the indigenous people who were whether it was harappan or uh, dholavira also belongs to the same uh, stretch as you know and that they established and the sanskrit came from there and culture came from there and uh, so on and so forth these are the two areas of uh, uh, if you may like it to like to say it as a, a contrarian position i don't want to contest a person like you you are a uh, very very uh, it's been a great pleasure to hear you sir thank you so i'm, I'm grateful for your generosity and you have uh, very liberal compliments uh, so please do not feel offended if i call you a liberal at least for a moment uh <clears throat> two migrations one is the migration uh, associated with sanskrit uh, from central asia people coming to india that is a usually contested uh, question and uh, tomorrow uh, not in the next lecture i will uh, get into that but as far as the origin of the homo sapiens is concerned it is a puzzle as to it may appear like a puzzle today to a 20th century 21st century 
साउथ एशियन इंडियन बांग्लादेशी और पाकिस्तानी एज टू वाई द होमोसेपियंस इमर्ज देयर एंड नॉट हियर द आंसर इज होमो एरेक्टस ऑफ ईस्ट एशिया और और द नियंडर थाल विच वॉज फाउंड इन यूरोप ऑल्सो दीज वे कम्पीटिंग स्पीशीज सम डिक्लाइंड एंड सम सर्वाइड इट इज ए ग्रेट आयरनी ऑफ हिस्ट्री दैट होमो इरेक्टस वॉज मच टॉलर दैन अस होमोसेपियंस एंड नियंडर थाल वॉज मोर इंटेलिजेंट दैन अस but the less tall less intelligent survived and uh, it spread and they had a clash also uh, they they had cross breeding as well so the, the, whatever knowledge about the remote past is available with sciences uh, has stated that the origin of homo sapiens is in africa i would be very happy if we suddenly found that homo i li- i like to imagine yes why not I and mean, why ever not i belong to india i am very proud of india accidentally i was born here if i were born in russia i would imagine that why not homo sapiens belong to russia it's a right of a russian or an australian Uh, but uh, just as all australians have to accept that europeans who settled there have come from europe maybe 4000 or 5000 years from now the australian generations there might say that australians belong there they did not come from europe uh, but they did i like to believe i mean i would like to imagine yes they uh, nature does not prevent Uh, humans being to emerge from you know from the previous species into this form in all continents yet there are scientific uh, uh, scientific observations which help us here that is the the climate of the world was not like this prior to 9000 years 10000 years before christ this 12000 years ago the climate was of a different kind that there were immensely cold periods when life uh, did not uh, uh, life was not possible in most part of the parts of the world you began with that uh, very good observation about our climate being so good our waters our but if we go to a time 8000 years before the holocene up to the beginning of the holocene that's 18000 years before christ to about 11000 years before christ uh this plate of the earth what in a very distant past was called the gondwana uh was more than half covered by ice sheet and those the traces are there and uh, and very uneven weather causing deserts and uh, the homo sapiens did not come from that part of africa which is you know uh, uh, curse with occurs with the sahara desert but for the south and east i will have to wait for some more time before we know more about the uh, origin of the homo sapiens from sciences to accept my own wishful thought that after all why did they not come from india and uh, all that i can do is like eliza de little sing but uh, uh, what is that uh, but uh, why does a man, uh, why do the english speak cannot speak english why do the english cannot speak english uh, what uh, the reason for us to feel happy is from wherever the homo sapiens came in this part of the world they behaved more like humans by remaining multilingual they are happy in being multi ethnic they are completely tolerant of all religions that is human to be human 
is to be accepting others. And we've been very humane in this part of the world. I think if we continue that, we'll at least continue to perform the minimum obligation of homo sapiens, to think like humans with a heart, with a head. And I, I, I feel very moved by you know, your, your, uh, your proposition that let us one day prove that humans actually originate from here. I will be so happy. I'll distribute Dharwad Pedas to the entire world if that comes. I want humans in this subcontinent to be humans. And in that desire of yours, I see a great liberal depth of thought. Thank you so much. You inspire me. Thank you. Uh, sir, you talked about uh, these uh, people who were in class and people who were tribe. And you told that we were like cousins, you know. We, I mean, DNA-wise, there is no difference because finally we all came what about 65,000 years back from Africa and so on and so forth. So, of course, if we go back, 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 then everybody comes from Africa, so everybody is cousin. So, leaving that aside for a moment, is it that these tribes and the Yati people were in India at the same time, or is it the tribes people had come to India before the Jati people? Thank you. <coughs> David Rick has uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, at least 45,000 years before Christ, communities in the south uh, had acquired tribal characteristics. And that is uh, protecting their unit through marriage within. The jati, that, that uh, idea of blood purity, uh, came to the jatis much later. And uh, that is the post Harappan. Uh, the Harappans got distributed through labor, who subsequently kept themselves distributed through observing blood purity. Uh, there is a study of a community called the Vyasiya, not the Vaishyas, not the Vyas of Mahabharata. I'll speak about that Vyas four days from now, the Vyasiyas and uh, the uh, studies show that they kept their blood purity so intact despite uh, being in commerce with others, being in professions with others almost for 2000 years and we know so many communities take that pride uh, of marrying inside though it is not very healthy, uh, that practice, that jati came after the rise of the idea of hierarchy of labor. The tribes did not have the idea of hierarchy of labor, but blood purity, yes, tribes have been head hunting in some parts of India. Among the Nagas, the Tainites, the 18 tribes, sub-tribes, they speak 18 different languages and they don't understand each other's language at all. Therefore, they have to invent a super language called for connecting themselves as so that they can transact with each other. They observed extreme blood purity. One day I had gone to the Garo Hills with some friends and they said, don't cross the border because if you go there, they might attack you. Head hunting tribes, blood purity. But blood purity was in terms of the uh, endogamy, but hierarchy of labor, which is a different principle, that came in later. And uh, that was of the production of wealth as wealth, not as subsistence. And wealth being used for trading. Harappa, the Elamite, the Akkadian, the, you know, so, so, the, all those names of ancient civilizations, they were trading with each other. They were, they had formed supply lines. And uh, the, it is there that Wealth as surplus. I mean, I'm not getting into the Marxist theory of surplus. That's much later. 
but a, but a, 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 an oversimplified part of that theory. Uh, the three things happen with the creation of surplus. One is uh, scripts emerge. Script is a surplus of language, not essential of language. Script is a deposit of language. Script is for language transaction beyond your needs, basic needs and capacity. So scripts therefore always emerge first in arithmetical science and then into science for words. It's for counting, counting. It's numeracy, not literacy. The surplus created the hierarchy of communities as castes and the non-surplus economies of others that kept purity, blood purity, remained as tribes. This is an oversimplified view, but what happened in Central India did not happen the same way in the South or in the same way in the uh, you know, Western parts, which are now outside India, in Afghanistan, for instance. Because the forms of entertainment were very different in these parts. In our music, Sare uh, Gama Pada, G for Gandhar. And what is Gandhar? Gandhar is Afghanistan. It's the Afghan uh, uh, culture of voice, which came into our music, but from tribes. Cultures, uh, sorry, cultural production among the tribes varied a lot. We still have to do enough study of that. Uh, we will be able to do it only when we look at them sympathetically. Uh, but the social uh, formation of tribes and jatis that is uh, well studied, reasonably validated by actuals on the ground, and to that extent, I can say that tribes, all of us were tribes at one time, but we became jatis when we learned the sin of accumulation. And so somebody later had to come uh, who was from a nomadic uh, pastoral community, somebody who was who specialized in keeping cows and breeding cows to tell us that uh, in greed lies destruction. Uh, in greed uh, grows krodha, violence, and in krodha uh, you forget your krodha bhavati sammoha sammoha smruti vibrama smruti brahmushat buddhi nasha buddhi nasha pranashati. Out of greed comes violence. Uh, he was trying to bring those people together, but that togetherness was not possible. What we accepted was looking at all this as ours. The tribes were ours and the castes were ours. We accepted all those spaces. Allah was ours, Ishwar was ours. We accepted all those gods. And that, all, that allness of those got into the constitution, which made India a proud, free country, respecting many spaces. But that memory is dying very rapidly today. Probably that memory is being supplanted by artificial memory which keeps surveillance over us. We send so many messages to the young ones among us which brainwashes people. But that's a different subject. However, as a very proud Indian, Indian proud for its manyness, I feel sad that the manyness is getting shrunk. Rajashekhar had said there are two types of greatnesses. One is with many, the other is with only one. I believe in this greatness with many. That's what makes India a different country, a civilization from all other civilizations. And I feel proud of India for its respect for diversity. Thank you. Thank you. After coming down, you've partially answered my question, sir. But uh, I want to bring us into the present state of affairs where, uh, as you have worked with the, the tribes, tribals, as we might call them in your context, there is a 
concerted effort to totally change the conversation about them to marginalize such a large section of our population to perhaps incarcerate people who speak for the uh, tribes and tribals, etc. They're being ca incarcerated. As urban Naxalites. <laughs> uh, yes, Naxalites, <laughs> etc. So how can we create an awakening, prevent such an obliteration like what's happened in America or uh, what's happened in Australia or in New Zealand? Such a vast population of our country, they just cannot be erased. You know, what can we do about such an issue? The people of this continent are uh, deep and clever. And uh, they responded in the past to the British colonialism uh, using their means of silence, non-cooperation, fasting. I mean, these are things that a woman does. Gandhi used those methods. The feminine alone can challenge the masculine. I mean, if somebody says, look at my what a centimeters of padding here. The voice, the feminine in the voice, the compassionate, the caring, and people are there. Uh, our people accept many spaces. So they sometimes allow roles to beings of different kind, but do not accept that as a permanent state of being. Uh, uh, I, this uh, subcontinent has seen so many uh, ups and downs, if one may like to say. In the present context, uh, Ambedkar has one formula. Dr. Ambedkar said, it's edu educate, uh, unite, and organize and agitate. Uh, education has a very little chance left in this country because our university system has collapsed and become spineless. It does not, it has stopped producing knowledge really, useful knowledge. Uh, but uh, but uh, Indians will come together uh, when uh, we bring at the center of our discourse the idea of India as a federation, as against a unitary India. Because Indians feel very comfortable in being a federation rather than being one marching nation like the, you know, J uh, incidentally, uh, uh, I was going to say like Hitler, Germany, but I will not say that. I will say something else. Incidentally, it's exactly 100 years ago, exactly to the date, 100 years ago, that Mussolini came to power in Italy. And he had about uh, uh, 60,000 children marching at his order in the streets. He was in minority in, his, uh, in the first election. He was 56 against some uh, 40, uh, four, uh, 430 members in the in their Senate, the Italian. Uh, but he terrorized by using those children. He terrorized uh, masses by using those children who were marching to his orders. And uh, therefore, the Italian uh, authority, the king, asked him to become the prime minister, removing a popularly elected majority government. And we saw what happened to Mussolini he, uh, 20 years later, in 1945. His body remained in public space as a spectacle for people to see what Italy should not have done. Italy, which was the seat of Christianity, Christianity, which evolved around the idea of love thy neighbor as thyself. When a civilization goes against its very being, the first thing it does is to return to its sense of being. That's what I'm trying to say through these lectures. 
Thank you.